Good morning, everybody. Awesome, awesome, wonderful. All right, good to see the house of the Lord full this morning with lots of folks here this morning with us. And those that are watching on Facebook or listening on our website, welcome. We're happy that you could be here with us. Um, happy Mother's Day. Yes, we're grateful for all of our mothers and mother figures and people that have been in all of our lives. Some have already gone to heaven and in glory, and some are still here, and some of us are still uh, doing our best to act like the mother of God, who was someone who loved everyone and certainly uh, showed unconditional love to everyone. So I think all of our mothers, one way or another, in the humanness that they, we, they may not have given us everything they needed, but they did the best that they could. And so we also thank God for all of them and anyone else who is somebody like a mother to each of us, which we can be to one another, especially God. Uh, one quick announcement, Tuesday, May 11th, this coming Tuesday at 10 o'clock, the church is going to um, provide the space for uh, My Care Medical and Humana to come out with a food pantry. So they're going to give out food out in the parking lot, as we often do. So if you or somebody you know needs food, send them our way this coming Tuesday, 10 a.m. Continuing to bring out and reach out to touch the lives of others and, and feed their bodies as well as their souls. But we're going to have some soul food right now. What do you say about that? Amen. Yes, amen, amen. Let us pray, let us pray. God, we thank you, God, for bringing us here to this time and to this place. We thank you, God, for making a way that we could be together safely, God. And we thank you for opening up our doors and for bringing people safely to us, God. We thank you for all the ways in which you continue to show your blessings, your love, and your constant care for each and every one of us. I pray for anyone who can't be here this day, God, I ask you just let them feel your presence. If they're watching or listening, God, help them to know that you're right there beside them as we are in spirit. Let your Holy Spirit come down upon the service this day and fill us up with all that you are so we can fill others up as well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning. Let's enter into some praise and worship this morning. Do you guys feel the love in this place? Yeah, it is. I got to say, it's nice to be back inside. So uh, let's get to our feet if you can or willing and able. We're going to start with a little toe tapper with a banjo this morning, right? Time out. Technical difficulty. It's not, now that everybody stood up, it's not working. Or I moved. Matter. Or I moved. I moved the computer. <laughs> yeah, the intro is awesome. <laughs> hey, got I it. see words. I got it. I can see the clouds rolling.
worship anyway, right? All right. You got the next one up? Here we go. Two, three, four. exercise somehow, right, these days? <laughs> Running for Jesus, always, always, always. He's our strength and our shield, our power to keep us going, always, right? Yes. And there's no problem God cannot solve, ever, 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 ever. Now, we're coming to the time of our offering this morning, and it comes from the book of Deuteronomy, and it's something that I think all of us can really attribute all the blessings we have to God and then God asks, asks of us to then share what those blessings are, are with others. And as the Israelites had come out of the wilderness and in the land of Egypt, they went into the promised land and they were fully abundant, had a whole new life there. And so God gave them directions as to how to treat other people as a result of the fact that they were now blessed and they were to be a blessing to others. So in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 19, it says this. When you're harvesting your crops and forget to bring in a bundle of grain from your field, don't go back and get it. Leave it for the foreigners, orphans, and widows. Then the Lord your God will bless you in all you do. When you beat the olives from your olive trees, don't go over the boughs twice. Leave some of the olives for the foreigners, orphans, and widows. This also applies to the grapes in your garden. Do not glean the vines after they are picked, but leave any remaining grapes for the foreigners, orphans, and widows. Remember, you were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. That is why I'm giving you this command. So we have been foreigners somewhere, somehow, some way, all of us, right? And we as a church, we continue to realize that we have been given so much and so as a result, we're here as a church body 
to give to the foreigners, the orphans, the widows, the hungry, whoever they may be, as the word of God still tells us today. So one of the reasons that we bring this up this morning is the fact that we have a mission in, the, in El Tamarindo in the Dominican Republic. They're foreigners. Many of them are orphans. Many of them are fatherless or motherless. And all of them need to be fed, to be educated, to be cared for. And so every time we ask on the first and the second Sunday for a donation to that mission, it's so that we're, one, completing the scriptures that tell us that we once had nothing ourselves. We were once foreign, sometimes even away from God. And God's provided for us and continue to give us an abundant life, all of us. And so we take a portion of what God has given us and we give it to the foreigners, the widows, and the orphans. And that will be a blessing to all of us in, in return. We don't do it for the blessing. We give because it is a blessing. And we know we can change lives as a result. So this morning, you have the opportunity to give. Anybody that's watching, if you want to use our website, you can do so. There's a secure giving link that's there. You can use our mobile app as another way to give. You can do a recurring gift. You'll notice on the website, you have some choices about giving to the general budget of the church, which is for all of our ministries and works, as well as you'll see missions on there. So that'll be your opportunity. If you've got some extra grain, some extra olives, or some extra grapes, Put them in the offering plate, <laughs> and God will bless you as a result. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here in this awesome place, your home, the place where you taught us all the ways in which we are to live, that you give us everything we need for all of our lives all the time, God. You've given beyond measure ways that we could never even count. And we thank you, God, that you also in turn give us the opportunity to help care for those that are foreign to us, that don't live in our country, that we might not even know or ever get to know, God. Someone who's different from us, God, but they are all your children. And we thank you, God, that you give us each the opportunity to give a portion of what we have, all, even the leftovers, Lord. You give us so much more, and we know that you continue to provide even more after that as well. So may we give of our first fruits to you, God, all the blessings we have, and may we also care for all the other people you put in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
there's a time, the time that we go into our prayers and our praises. And this book is filled up. Um, some of these prayers we've been praying for for a while. Some of these have turned into praises in this book. And some of them we celebrated last week that we had some prayers answered. And so as we go into prayer, I just ask that you go in with a hopeful expectation that God is already there. And sometimes it just takes a while or sometimes something happens in your life that just slaps you up against the face. I promise you, it may not feel like it in the moment, but God is right there beside you to help you get through that. So as we go into prayer, let's go in with a hopeful expectation, knowing that God's already there in whatever's going on in your life. Let us bow. God, we come to you with joy in our hearts, with strife in our hearts. God, we come to you with all that comes with just being human, God, and living in this world. God, we pray for Matt and Laura Miller in the sudden and unexpected loss of their daughter, Brittany. Prayers for their son, Mackenzie, and the rest of the family as they grieve and celebrate her life. Prayers of strength for Paul to lean on you, God, to relieve him of his addiction to cigarettes. God, we pray for his health to be restored. We pray for Deb's brother-in-law to find employment. And Lord, while he's waiting, provide him hope. God, we continue to pray for Grandma Pat that you just heal her body, Lord. God, we praise you for a good trip to visit family in Tallahassee. We pray for Rini and an upcoming medical test, Lord, that you just be with her as she gets those results. We pray for Rhonda for a medical test tomorrow and for the results to be positive, Lord. We praise you for healing and strength of Rhonda's dad and that his health has been sustained. We praise you for Linda's daughter that her COVID test was negative, Lord, and that you just be with her coworker who, who is positive and is ill with COVID, Lord. We pray for Karen's sister's heart and for her health, Lord, that you just be with her right now wherever she is, Lord, and give her strength. We praise you for safe travels from Florida to North Carolina. And we praise you, God, we pray for mommy and mama on Mother's Day. Love, Anthony. <laughs> God, we pray for anyone celebrating Mom's Day without their mom today, Lord, and we just ask that you help them to celebrate their mom and the time that they had with them here on earth, Lord. Prayers for Don and her family as they got the news um, that the cancer in Don's body moved from stage two to stage four. God, we continue to pray for friend Sarah's health and for pain relief. We pray for her doctors to have guidance and wisdom to help her with, with those health issues, Lord. We continue to pray for Christopher that you continue to be with him, Lord, and we praise you for the progress that he has made. God, we praise you for a condo being rented, Lord. We thank you for, for that financial blessing, God. God, we come to you with these, almost every other prayer and every other praise, and we thank you for being in the midst of those prayers, God, and we thank you for answered prayers through those praises, Lord. You're absolutely wonderful, Lord, and words cannot describe what you are within our life, God, and just help us to have a courageous faith when it's hard to feel your presence within these things within our life, God. In your precious name we pray. Amen.
and it's you we adore sing it So last year was a year of waiting. And look, here we are. We made it through. Whatever we had going on, whatever things that we've lost, the, the situations that we found ourselves in, some good, some bad, some indifferent, some all over the place, God has been faithful. God has been faithful. God has been faithful. So we also need to be that faithful, right? We need to also live our lives for God and do for others what God has done for us. Being there for them. Being, being someone that they can count on. Being compassionate, caring, loving. Being like Ruth. Ruth. We're going to go to the book of Ruth this morning. Ruth. In fact, the interesting thing, I, you know, sometimes words and names, you know, they always mean so much to me as I look at the Old Testament or I look throughout Scripture. And Ruth, her name actually meant friend. Hmm, right. Not the kind of friend you have on Facebook sometimes, but a real loyal friend. Someone who's there through thick and thin. As Jesus even said, that, that a, a, the friend sticks closer than a brother, it says in the book of Proverbs. So that's what Ruth was and is. And so we, we also want to look at the fact that she was somebody that you would not expect to be someone that God would use in a great, magnificent way. In fact, throughout the, throughout the scriptures, you rarely see a Bible uh, chapter with a woman's name in it. Ruth, Esther. Does it matter? Each of them, what we see complement and characterize who God is. And that's why their names were remembered and written down about. Because it was also quite unusual back in the day that women would be the ones to take over and be the ones to help lead, guide, and direct. But many women throughout the scriptures, when you really search through the scriptures, there's a lot of women in there that did an awful lot for a lot of people. And they just don't always get named. But we're going to name Ruth this morning, the friend. Now, the other side of that is we also know the word ruthless. In fact, you know that when you look up ruthless in the Bible, it, I'm sorry, in the dictionary rather, it says to be without Ruth, having no Ruth. What's a Ruth? Well, here's what the name Ruth means when you look it up in the dictionary. Compassion for the misery of another. Wow. So not only is she a friend, she had the right name, but when we are like Ruth, as opposed to be Ruthless, that means we have compassion for the misery of somebody else. When life becomes not about me, myself, and I, that trinity, it becomes about you, they, and them, right? We care for others more than we care for our self, unless you're Ruthless. Oh, okay. So we're going to be full of Ruth, okay? Ruthful. Ruthful is fruitful. There we go. I'll just, you know, just add, add lib to it, right? So what do we know about Ruth? Well, let's look at the story as we see it. It's four short chapters in the Bible. We're not going to go through all four. Many of you already know the story, and I'll kind of, you know, just give you the highlights on it. But I want to cover the most important aspects of it because all of us want to be like Ruth, right? We want to be Ruthful as opposed to Ruthless. All right, beautiful. Ruth chapter 1. 
In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a man from Bethlehem in Judah left the country because of a severe famine. Now let me begin there to tell you that in the time of judges, there was no king of Israel. In fact, if you go, the, the chapter before is actually where the book of Judges ends. Bethlehem was not in a good place back then. In fact, the last verse says, In those days Israel had no king, so the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. <laughs> That's always a problem, is it not? <laughs> so there was nobody to teach them in a king in a godly way how to live their lives. So they did whatever they wanted to do. Most of it was dark and sinful. Just let me leave it right there. So this is the time when there's also a famine in Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem actually means house of bread, but they were breadless. Part of the reason is they had turned away from God. These are the same people that God had taken out of Egypt, fed them daily manna all the time, provided for all their needs, right? What happens when we get all full of ourselves and we get everything that we need sometimes? Who do we often forget? God until we run out again, and then we're back to God. That's sometimes the human nature. That's what we see happened in the book of Judges. So there actually was a famine at that time. So he took his wife and two sons and went to live in the country of Moab. Now, Moab was a little bit worse than Bethlehem in terms of the fact that it was a pagan nation. And I don't want to go into all the gory details, but it was awful things that they did. Especially, never mind. So, point being, they were worse than the people that lived in Bethlehem. So you got really bad people hanging around in these two places, right? What do they all need? <laughs> I'll say. Okay. The man's name was Elmelech, and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Mahan and Kilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. So what we know about them is that one time, and we know that they were followed the God of Israel, that they had believed in God, and that's who they continued to follow. And then they moved to Moab, into the pagan nation. And so they, during their stay, Emelech died, and Naomi was left with two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, and the other named Ruth. So what these Israelite people do, they marry two Moabite women. Now I want you to understand something about the Israelites and the Moabites at the time. They hated each other. Not like we see anywhere today ever at all. So needless to say, needless to say, they marry these women. And so 10 years later, Mahon and Kilion died. This left Naomi alone without her husband or, or sons. So what we see transpire is these two men die. These, Naomi's left without her sons. And all that's left is Ruth, Naomi, and Orpah. That's who's left behind. Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. Isn't it just like God? That even though people are sinful over here and they're not following him, they, and they're running out of food, isn't it just like God to bring food again? That's the kind of merciful God we have. Even when we do the worst possible things, there's always mercy, there's always grace, and there's always God finding a way to continue to feed us and draw us back to him and meet our needs, despite what we deserve or don't deserve. Aren't you glad you don't get what you deserve all the time? Hey, well, loud amen on that one. Yes. <laughs> I love mercy and I love grace. Yes, I do. <sighs> Psalm 147 refers to this, by the way. It speaks about how God would provide bread all the time for people. Just, just so you know, there's always a connection, spiritually speaking. So, Naomi and her daughters-in-law daughters got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. With her two daughters-in-law, she set out from the place where she had been living. They took the road that would lead them back to Judah. Long trip they're going on. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back 
to your mother's home instead of coming with me. And may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husband and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. So Naomi's realizing, you two girls, go ahead, go back to Judah, go back to where you, you're going, and I'm, we're going to part ways. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. So what we, what we see transpire, instead of going back to Moab, they're deciding to go on with Naomi to where? Bethlehem, Judah, the land of Judah. Bethlehem, it's kind of a name we kind of know from something. Okay. But Naomi replied, why should you go with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who can grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' homes, for I am too old to marry again. And even if that were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? What did Naomi think she's only good for? Given some, you know, bearing sons to give to these women. She had nothing to offer them, she thought. Sometimes we don't think we have anything to offer anybody based on what we've always done and been, right? When sometimes life changes and we're doing one thing over here and suddenly that's no longer the thing we're doing, we think we now we have no purpose anymore, right? We have a role over here and that role is not going to be anymore and we don't know what to do with ourselves sometimes. Is that right? Are we ever without a purpose? Ever, ever, ever. Okay. Beautiful. Because you're in it for the long haul anyway, right? Absolutely. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and again they wept together. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth insisted on staying with Naomi. See, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same, right? Her gods. Go back to that, those pagan gods that you had. That's what Orpah's doing. You see the difference between Orpah and Ruth? There's always a difference in all of us where we choose which path to take. Now, Orpah went back. Maybe it was for her. It was she had something that she needed there, so that's where she went. We're not here to judge her. All we're showing is there is a contrast between people sometimes, right? Because Ruth is Ruth, right? She's a friend. <laughs> and she has compassion for the misery of others, including Naomi. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. I will go wherever you go and live wherever you live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. She's making a vow, right? Pledging an oath to this person. I will die where you die and will be buried there. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. Is that loyalty or what? Till death do us part. This is a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. One would not expect somebody to bow that kind of, that loyalty to somebody else, would you? But she does, because she's Ruth. And we all want to be Ruth full, right? So the two continued on their journey. When they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was stirred by their arrival. Is it really Naomi? And then Naomi says, don't call me that, which means pleasant. Instead, call me Mara, which is bitter. For the Almighty has made my life bitter for me. She lost her sons, right? She lost her future of, of grandchildren and so forth. She had become bitter, went from pleasant to bitter. And the word Mara, it actually comes from the Old Testament when we read in the book of Exodus where the time when the water had turned bitter, right? It was called Mara, bitter. And what does Moses do? He picks up a stick and throws it into the water, and it goes from bitter to sweet. Bitter to sweet. What's going to happen to Naomi, do you think? Even though right here, right now, because of her loss, because of her grief, because of the future she thought she was supposed to have has disappeared on her. She has, she has no conception of what the future holds for her. She has become 
bitter in her sorrow and in her grief, hasn't she? But what do we know God always does when there's something bitter that happens in our life, all of our lives? What follows bitter? Sweet. Sweet. That's where bittersweet chocolate came from. <laughs> but she says to the people, call me, call me bitter. The Lord has done terrible things to me. You see the same God that Ruth is going to go follow? Unfortunately for Naomi right now, she's upset with God, right? You ever been upset with God over things that have happened? Of course, all of us have, right? We can become bitter, can't we, as Naomi did. Become Amara. Until what happens? God steps in, right? God steps in, just like he stepped in for Moses and that bitter water. And God steps in, and suddenly that bitterness we often feel, God sends a person very often to bring some sweetness into our lives, to add some sugar and add some honey and add some hope and add some peace, and add some comfort, and add some compassion, because we care about the misery of others, we step in, and we say, I'm going to help you from your bitterness, help your life become sweet again. That's what Ruth is all about, is it not? That's who Jesus Christ is all about, right? He takes what was bitter, and he, go, and he takes what's bitter in us, those things in us that sometimes that have plagued us that we can't seem to get over and we continue to, we, we can lose our faith, we can lose our hope, we can lose our sense of purpose if we stay in bitterness. But God doesn't leave us in bitterness, does he ever? Sweetness comes. When? I don't know. But it always does. Will it always come instantaneously? Are you going to go from pain to pleasure just like that? Of course not. There's a process along. That's why this Bible, this particular scriptures have four chapters to it. <laughs> but I do know this. God has a plan. God has a way out. God has a way of turning every life circumstance from bitter, from awful, from sad, from depression, to glory and happiness and joy and peace again. God does that all the time. Always. Never stops. Why? Because God is Ruth. <laughs> he has compassion for anyone who feels that they're finding themselves in misery. But God also uses people like us to be the sweetness in their life, to walk them with that, through that, right? We notice that Orpah went back to her town, but Ruth stuck right beside Naomi. Can you imagine being around a bitter mother-in-law? <laughs> yeah, oh, whoops. <laughs> I'm not pointing any fingers at anyone. The problem is we don't worry about the fact that they're bitter, do we? We can't dwell on that, can we? You can't, you can't get bitter with them, can you? See, you have to be the sweetness. So you're the sweetness of somebody's bitterness. And then you become bittersweet chocolate together. Yum. Back on that chocolate again. I got to watch this diet. So they go back, and here's what transpires. Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law, Ruth, the young Moabite women. They arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. At the beginning of the harvest. See, they were coming and they were running away from a lot of things, were they not? Famine, that's the reason they were even leaving and why their husband had left, right? They left the famine to go find food. They go to Bethlehem, which is really a city in darkness right now because of the sinfulness that's going on around there. But in the midst of even that, there are some good people there. In fact, when we see in the book of Isaiah, the people that have seen are living in darkness will see a great light. Merry Christmas. But do you see the connection? Who's the light in the story? Ruth is the light, is the light in this particular story, right? Jesus says, later, you may or may not already know that Ruth was the great-grandmother of Jesus. You'll see him in Matthew, her in Matthew later. 
What a lineage, right? A Moabite woman. Someone people hated. Someone no one cared about. But she cared about others. And throughout the rest of the scriptures that we, that we read about in this story, Ruth goes out and gleans, which we heard about in the book of Deuteronomy earlier today about her offering. She goes and gets the leftovers so she can feed Naomi. She works hard through the day and night. And Boaz is there. Turns out he's a relative of Naomi, and eventually he redeems all of them, right? When you get to the book, the end of the book of, of Ruth, chapter 4, their life changed dramatically from that point on. Boaz marries Ruth, and the story has a happy ending. Ta-da! But what's the point of all this? Ruth was willing to go and walk with someone who lost everything. She was there to be loyal, compassionate, selfless, work hard, give of her time, energy, and efforts to love another human being who at the moment wasn't the best frame of mind person. Naomi could have been called negative Nancy during this time. And I don't know about you, but you love to volunteer to help the negative Nancys in your life, right? Unless you're ruthless. So what I want to teach us all this morning is what we can learn from this at, in all the areas of all of our lives. At one time or another, all of us are going to be Naomi, Omara, or Ruth. Many of us have gone through some things, and we can become bitter over those things. And we can blame God for it and be upset with God. But God, I pray, is going to put another person in your life like Ruth, a loyal friend, someone who has compassion for your misery, and they walk into your life and open the door of light, hope, and joy again. And if nothing else, they just stick it out with you and go as far as you will allow them to continue to go with them. In this disposable life that all of us live in, it's so easy to unfriend anybody with the push of a button these days. It's so easy to end relationships for the least little thing that goes wrong in them. And if you're anybody like me who has faults, you're probably someone that can drive somebody right up the wall, back down again, out the door, around the corner, up the street, back around the corner, up the wall, over the corner, down on the road, and da -da, there you are. It's me, I'm back. <laughs> we all need Ruth in our life, don't we? We all, know, we all need to be people who will go with people the long way through. Most of us and many of us become very uncomfortable when people go through loss or grief or change or, or they show their up, down, and all around things that they've got going on in their life because they're imperfect. But just like Ruth and just like Jesus Christ who never leaves us or forsakes us, loves us unconditionally, all of us need to find a way to be like Ruth, to be there with people for the long haul. So sometimes we're the ones that need a person walk alongside of us to be loyal and compassionate towards us. But I promise you this, there'll be a day when that will also change when the other person becomes the one that needs you to walk alongside of them for the long haul. So my question today is to all of us here at this particular church, are you ready to be ruthful? Are you in it for the long haul? Are you going to love God no matter what happens up, down, or all around? You're going to continue to serve God no matter what? You're going to be a light in the darkness. All right, you said it.
And I actually believe and know and trust that most of you are those people. Why I know you're those people is I see you here. And I see you serving. I've seen you serve. Even this last year of waiting, you did what you could in terms of prayer and loving and caring and donating and giving of yourselves. That's what I guess sets this church apart. We are the church of Bethlehem. Many of us have been in the darkness, but we've seen a great light. We love the fact that we've been redeemed by Jesus Christ and forgiven. And we also know that we're also people from time to time that have been in emotional, mental, physical, or spiritual need. And we're all so grateful that we have a Savior who walks up beside us and is our com constant, compassionate friend who cares about our misery. And that's also exhibited through the people here. When you walk alongside someone for the long haul, not stopping halfway, not stopping when you're tired, not just thinking about yourself. That's how you show others what really being a follower of Christ is all about. So let the ruthless people be ruthless. We're going to be ruthful. We're going to care and be compassionate and understand the misery of others. And watch and see what God does in the process of that. God had a big plan for Ruth, and it certainly wasn't just to find a husband. <laughs> it was to show the beautiful example of what it's like to be like Jesus Christ. That's how she could be the ancestor of Christ, because she was just like him. His genes came from her, because she found the God that we all pray you also find. God of love, the God of mercy, the God of grace, and the God of giving and caring. So you're in it for the long haul? Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you that you are a faithful, loving friend. You're with us through every life circumstance. And you also bless us, God, with others, people in all of our lives that are there with us as loyal, compassionate friends. We thank you for the beautiful examples that each of us can be of who you are, God. The qualities that Ruth had are your qualities, Lord Jesus, evidenced as you came to this earth. You gave all of yourself for all of us, and you brought us into a place of, of light, a place of joy, a place of peace. And you've always got great plans for us, God. So help us know that even though we don't know the end of the story, that as we walk, even in those times of famine, they may be spiritual, emotional, or material famine, you find a way to provide the bread of life to us all in terms of other people, God, who feed us your love. We thank you for that now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. I'll see all you roots a lot later, I guess. And I guess virtual hugs to everybody. I love you all. Thank you so much for being here today. God bless you all, all that are on Facebook as well. Stay my friend, please. Bye. <laughs> See you tonight. See you tonight for our song and a prayer at 7. <laughs>